Uh, so I'm James. Uh, I work for Interlink. We're building out a new global IP backbone, and we are also building a um, a new automation platform to support that. And many people here, I guess, are involved in automation networks in some way. Just writing a few bash scripts or Python scripts to automate your config is pretty common these days. Most people are dipping their toe into Python and stuff. We work in networking. Um, but the times are changing, and now we're getting to the point where a bit of config automation is kind of not quite up to scratch. And you, you, we need to take it to the next level, which is like automating our entire sort of business operations and not just config stuff. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing, building out a new automation platform for our new network. And like I said, Greenfield is not the promise that everybody says it is. One thing in particular is you get the opportunity to make some terrible decisions, which you simply do not get the chance to do if you have a brownfield network. Those decisions are already made. So um, hopefully I'm going to share some lessons learned that will <laughs> prevent other people from making some same or similar mistakes. So I'll just quickly go through who we are, the background, and the problems we faced, and then the rest of the, the talk should be um, the lessons learned that I hope everyone can relate to. So we want to be the first sustainable connectivity provider in the world. This is something really important to us. We want fully automated connectivity services, and we want fully transparent services, the way we do pricing, status updates, operational changes. Um, and that sounds like I'm trying to give you the hard sell for our company, but there's a reason I'm telling you about this. These are our business objectives. And something links all of those business objectives, and that is automation. Everyone is becoming more aware of sustainability. It is incredibly hard to track your um, three different scopes of emissions without automation. It's incredibly hard to do automated networks and services without automation. And if you want to have like up-to-date pricing and flexible pricing, operation status, you know, real-time monitoring exposed to your customers, you need it's automation up and down. Basically, there's no escaping it. So just a quick example, right, because I don't think most people in here are too interested in like the sustainability aspect, so I'll talk about the networking aspect, right? So for example, on the networking side, we built a portal. This is me. I logged into the portal. I want to buy an IP transit service. So I choose my choosing a pop in Berlin. I choose what I want. I want a 10 gig port, and I want V4, and I want V6, and I just sort of click through the wizard, right? Next, put in my AS number, password, choose a commit rate can choose next, get an overview, click order, done. And I get this. And you don't, really, don't worry about the text, it's too small. The point is, place the order, and loads of stuff happens because we have to automate our business operations and not just config you know, these days, right? So invoicing is set up, billing is set up, CRM, ERP, as well as the network stuff. Uh, monitoring is updated. So now I get this. There's an empty graph because this is a Docker running on my laptop. But you would now start to see, you know, you could see your traffic here, right, for example. So it's the whole thing is happening now. That's kind of where we are. So the status quo these days is automagic all the things, you know, not just a bit of con config jiggery pokery. And yeah, as I said, the migration to fully operate automations is a journey. I really hate the word journey, but there we go. Uh, even for Greenfield, right? Um, so it's, this is what the talk is about, right? So what are some questions you could be asking along the way? And spoiler, there's a lot of stuff that we did already in networking. We can use, we can transfer some of the same knowledge, right, to, to, to software. Um, so let's get into it. So number one, data modeling. What are you going to sell? We, so in this case, I did. I ordered an IP transit service. So I think most people who mo model services use what I, what I just call the Lego bricks approach. So in the portal, I ordered an IP transit service. Um, what I ordered was this list of components. I'm not sure how readable that is but I ordered a dual stack IP transit service. So that means that I ordered two BGP sessions, V4 and V6. I ordered a port. I ordered a VLAN because this is going to be on a sub interface. Um, and I ordered two prefixes, a V4 and V6 prefix, right? And then there's like a, a non-recurring and a recurring charge. So those are like the Lego bricks that make up my service. And when I want to develop another service, I can reuse the same bricks, BGP session, port and VLAN. That's what I need for a layer three VPN. Right, reuse the same Lego bricks. So I would encourage people to kind of take a sort of Lego bricks approach to, to doing your data modeling for services and stuff. Um, what will you model? You can, you can kind of save yourself a bit of time by looking at what you model explicitly versus implicitly. So an example of this would be, for example, IGP sessions. All your core routers have IGP sessions. So do you actually need to put all those into your configuration state database? Or is it something that you can kind of hard code? If two interfaces are core interfaces, they definitely have IGP. I don't need to like have that fact stored in the configuration database. It will implicitly be there. 
There's a bunch of stuff. NTP servers, DNS servers, every device is going to have them. So do I need to actually, for every device, specify the NTP server if they're the same for every device? So think about what will you model, because you can save yourself some time. You can always add it in later on if you need to change it, but you can save some time. Where will you model it? There's no such thing as the perfect database. Um, you can't store all your invoicing in the same system that you store all your network config. There's no one tool that's really good at storing all that stuff. That's live. Um, so we use a concept that we call global IDs. Global IDs is basically, we have a system we store all our customers and invoices in, ERP system. We have a config system and we have a few other systems as well. Um, we have another system that allocates unique global IDs for everything. So I can query the config system and give it my customer's global ID and get their config. And I can query the invoice system and give them this unique, same unique global ID and get all their invoices. So even though those systems have their own IDs, every system also, also stores the global ID because there's no such thing as one size fits all. So this allows us to tie the data together. So again, I recommend you think about how will you, so if you've got Netbox or something and Salesforce and they need to talk together, you need to think about how that's gonna happen. Um, I put why, yeah, so you, you don't necessarily need a single source of truth. This is something that's discussed in a lot of network automation um, talks. You don't need, like, because there's no such thing as one really great source of truth. Um, if you can tie multiple things that are good at their individual job together, you have the same effect. Um, and also with data modeling, think about when you're going to do, do data validation. It's not just like, what does the customer put in, in, in the order form? You know, is the AS number contain weird characters and stuff? Um, but it's also internally, if you want to operate your automations internally, like pop rollouts and stuff, um, you need to think about what is valid data. So the, you have to spend a lot of time up front doing data modeling, but in the long run, it really pays dividends. So basically, break down your services, have the Lego bricks, how are you going to validate the Lego bricks, what's a valid and not a valid combination of Lego bricks. Um, tech stack, then you can start to think about what you're going to do. Um, build one giant application that's really, really um, extensible but scales poorly, or split it out and have many, many individual applications that do one specific thing. Um, those scale really well, but they all have to speak to each other somehow. So now you've got a kind of a communication mess. Um, consider your user base. So I think most people in this room are going to be quite technical, or somewhere between pretty and very, I would say, in this room. Um, but do you know what? Um, it doesn't matter how technical people are. APIs, for example, which are like the thing, yeah, if, you, if everyone wants to use APIs for automating stuff, they are, make a terrible user experience. So even for very technical people, like what we have in this room, if you have to interact with APIs on a daily basis, it's very frustrating. There's a lot to be said for a half-baked GUI, um, even for technical people. Um, you know, APIs have things like expiring keys, whereas people are really good at remembering username and passwords. They're not very good at remembering API keys and stuff like this. So think about your users, even the technical ones. Try to reduce your technical debt. So these are the kind of lessons that you can carry over from networking, right? You, you obviously want to have as little technical debt as possible. But in the, in, I think we're not as used to spotting this in the dev world as we are in the networking world. So it, um, some network examples are things like Netbox, Ansible, Jinja2. They're very, very popular open source tools. We also use them as well. And they are full of problems. So every small business looks roughly like this, right? They're all using Microsoft Excel. Everyone who's technical hates it because they're like, don't you know what databases are? Yeah, well, you know what, Excel is easy to deploy, easy to use, easy to integrate. It just works, yeah? And it does create massive technical debt. And now we have the same thing with tools like Netbox and Ansible, right? They just work. Um, and you cannot blame people for using them. And within your organization, you have a mixture of people, right? Some who are incredibly technical and some who are not so technical. So I, I encourage you to kind of you know, adjust your lenses from the networking world to the software world and kind of try to, to be critical of these things and not just uh, rush into them. Um, I'm not going to go into this too much. It's, it's kind of a bit too detailed for this time slot, but this is approximately what our tech stack looks like. We have a web portal and an API at the front. So the orders coming in from the left-hand side, it's the right as I'm looking at, okay, it's the left. Um, orders come into a sort of back end and they get handed over to something in the middle that we call Cortex. And then Cortex is our sort of orchestration manager. And along the bottom are all the stages of our automation pipeline. And Cortex pushes 
things through the pipeline. And if jobs fail, it'll rerun the jobs and stuff like this and kind of make sure that it gets through the pipeline. Or if there's something that really can't go through, it notifies a human. Um, but there's something else to think about, right? So is we previously we wrote scripts and stuff that generated a bit of config and pushed the config to devices. But the problem now is that we, everyone, it's 2023, you have to be automating your business operations. So the billing has to be there. So the, your new customer has to have permissions to raise a support ticket. They want access to monitoring, blah, 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 blah. Um, all these things. So there's a process that you have somewhere that defines all the things that need to be done and in what order. And so you actually have to see the process through and deliver the process and not just configure a port as was previously the case. So you need to think about having some way of kind of implementing the process and seeing it through to completion. So in our case, that's Cortex, but I think you get the idea. Or I hope you get the idea. Um, this is all working for us. We're very happy, so on and so forth. But this is not perfect. Definitely not perfect. Um, there's one major problem with this, which I mentioned already. Everything here uses an API. Some of these things do actually have um, GUIs. So at the bottom, there's a box that says DSIM and IPAM. So that's Netbox. Netbox does have a GUI for people that know it. But you know, everything works via API because it's automated. This is a terrible user experience. It's hard to debug, and it's hard to monitor. Um, you know, so the same things that we spent years moaning about with um, networks, as you move more into the software world, you kind of have to do the same thing all over again. How will I monitor this software stack? How will I get alerts when it's going wrong? Um, how do I know that actually it's working, but it's just performing a bit poorly? This kind of thing. Um, it's kind of the same set of problems we have, but you need to shift your focus a bit. Um, what else? Tech stack. These are just examples right, of things to consider. We had a lot of discussions about doing full config replace versus partial config replaces on our devices. I'm not going to get into what's, what's, yeah, what's best is up for you. The point is, and you have to think about when automating stuff, what's practical. So regardless of which road you go down, right, with, with the config example, um, th this, this is going to affect your daily operations, basically, and these are the kind of things you have to configure. So a lot of people like to do full config replace on their devices because they absolutely guarantee the state of the device. That seems like an easy no-brainer. We always push the full device config, no matter how small the change, then we have guaranteed state on the device and we reduce state drift and this kind of thing. Sounds like a no-brainer. When you have a 3 a.m. on-call alert and you log in and you have to make a change to something and then somebody places an order, it your fix is gone. You have to back port, back port that fix into your automation platform to make sure that the next time a config is pushed out, it includes the fix and doesn't overwrite what you just did. And if you have a, like a portal or an API where people can log in 24 hours a day and order stuff, the next config push is just around the corner. <laughs> so. You, it's, it's, not, it's not just about what's technically right. What's best for your teams, your operations, your on-call processes. So those are the kind of things you need to think about with the software stuff and not just like what's really cool. Um, so that's what I call fragility versus issue masking. If you do partial config replace, there can be a problem somewhere in your config, but it's not being pushed. Your operations are still going, orders are still coming in. Um, full config is incredibly fragile, so you need very, very, very extensive testing and validation. Same with the source of truth. A lot of people talk about having some sort of magical source of truth where you store your information and then you push, push that information to the network. And that seems like a no-brainer. But then what about if you change something on the network? Should you pull it back into your source of truth? What if you have something defined in both places, the network and the source of truth, and they disagree? How do you reconcile the disagreement? And it's not that one thing is better than the other. It's about how does it affect your ability to support the service? How does it affect your ability to monitor it, to know when something changed, was it changed in the source of truth or on the network device, and in which direction did you import? You need some order or traceability. Um, so again, this is the kind of stuff you have to consider early on. Coding, okay, so we've, we've discussed um, data modeling and the kind of tech stack we have, and now we're going to get down to actually writing some code. I think most, most people are kind of playing around with um, Python and Bash and Go and this kind of stuff and Netbox and um, popular libraries and stuff, you know, Ansible. But if you want to kind of do this more as a team and then start building up and having, you know, you're contributing to each other's work and covering each other when you're, you know, people are on holiday and sick and this kind of stuff, you have to start putting together some sort of framework. 
you know, discussing a coding style, for example, and contribution guidelines, which to start with can just be a few lines of text, right? Make sure you write code like this, you know, maybe some guidelines on when to leave comments in the code and when not, right? And this kind of thing, just to, if you have people who are left, less comfortable with coding, just a bit of guidance on how, how they can contribute and make useful contributions. What are some sensible defaults? This also kind of goes back to data, data validation and what should, should you accept from the customer? What's clear to you as a techie is not clear to um, non-technical customers. You know, there will be non-technical people placing orders. For example, in, in some customer company, the engineers may not have the privilege to place orders. It may be a finance person that logs in and places an order. Right? So you have to kind of think about these things that your non-technical users. Um, again, if you're new to coding, um, and especially in a team, right, I suggest you look at tools like linting tools. Right, so there are lots. If you use stuff like Python, um, which is very popular for networking, oh, I can't think off the top of my head. There's a whole bunch. Um, I saw and Black um, and PyLint, and if you use Ansible, there's Ansible Lint, and if you use Ginger2, there's Ginger2 Lint. Very inventive naming. Lots of tools you can use though in your team to actually, so that across your team, all of you produce some vaguely similar code and playbooks and stuff that starts to make your collaboration with each other easier. Because you know, when someone's off and then I get the on-call call and I need to look at the stuff they've written, it's still roughly in the style that I write, so I understand it. It's kind of the same thing we used to do in the past, like years ago with network device config, you would perhaps have some text, text files and you would like fill in the blanks with text files and we'd all use the same text files. You kind of need to do the same thing with coding as well. Uh, and pull and merge requests. So if you use something like GitLab or GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever for kind of storing your code and managing your code bases and stuff, I strongly urge you to use what I call non-blocking merge requests, which is where someone, so in our code bases, somebody can raise a merge request, ask for someone else to review it, and yes, this looks great, or no, perhaps you could, you could change this, resolve something, then it gets merged in. If you are have a non-blocking merge, what I call a non-blocking merge request. That means that means when someone gets the 3 a.m. call and there's no one around to review it, they can still make the change. They're not blocked waiting for somebody to review. Right? If you have people who are not used to using this kind of process and maybe a bit more, we can say, maverick in their operations, just to introduce a blocking process is going to create layer eight problems right, at the human level and people aren't going to be happy. Um, so st you can start with some kind of light touch processes to help bring, bring people into the frame of mind of thinking about how can we work together and review each other's work and stuff like this. Um, and also documentation, where will it live? So what's very, very common is people document stuff in Git repos. Go on GitHub, right? Look at all the millions of lines of markdown text you'll see there, people writing documenting the code, they've got the documentation next to the code, which sounds like a fantastic idea, but you almost definitely internally have Confluence or Office 365 or whatever, where you also have documentation. So now your documentation is in two places. Where do I need to look when I get the on-call call? So just have a think about where you document stuff and try to create some sort of delineation. It's exactly the same we have with networking, right? But you know, it, it, it just looks different, but it's the same problem. Uh, testing your code, I think, uh, so if you don't know what unit tests are, it's the concept of basically creating very small tests. You write a piece of code, it sort of runs a single snippet, a single function of code, test the function, does what it should do. They're so small, the tests, they seem pointless. Why bother? Uh, it's because what happens in the future. So you start off by having one function, at some point function A calls some function B, at some point in the future, function B will call function C, and at some point in the future, function C will be broken. And this will show up because the function A unit test will fail. So immediately, there's a chain, each of the things in the chains are tested, you, just, you know instantly that something is broken and you can see where it's broken, which is a luxury that we don't normally have in networking, but we do have in software working. Um, CI pipelines, so I also encourage you to use non-blocking CI pipelines. I mentioned merge requests, so if you raise a merge request in one of our Git repositories, a bunch of um, automated tests run against your changes to check that nothing is broken. But what if there's no one around at three o'clock in the morning to approve them? So again, we start with non-blocking tests, so even if the tests fail, you can still merge because I know that this will fix the problem. And actually maybe the tests are broken. 
And then at some point in the future, you can move to blocking tests. You cannot merge anything um, unless the tests pass, because now we've been running the tests for six months. We know the tests are also mature, and they are without bugs. But I recommend you start with non-blocking to kind of uh, limit the layer eight problems. And test coverage is a never-ending story, so you just have to work out what's reasonable for you. We just, you know, so you can start by testing what I call making positive tests. Test what must work only. At some point, you can then test what must not work. And then at some point, you can test what should work. So you can break that down to stages um, because it, you can spend as much time writing tests as you do just writing your code. Uh, and create a simulation environment with some production data. I think this is one of the greatest things um, that we're missing in networking. Everybody, uh, you may or may not have worked at places with wonderful labs, with everything you could think of in them. And I've also, you know, also may, you may have worked at places with basically nothing, and you rarely got to test anything before doing it in production. The one beauty about software is, of course, we can just spin up containers and virtual machines and test virtually everything we want. Um, so I, again, strongly recommend that you capitalize on this opportunity. I think most people here, if you work in networking, especially operations, will definitely have you know, caused an outage or 10 at some point. I've created absolutely loads. Um, debugging. Software is hard. It is not user-friendly. I strongly recommend you take the time to write some user-friendly error messages. So we have spent really a non-trivial amount of time going through our code, catching errors, and then making sure that we actually then uh, produce a human-friendly error message that actually describes what may be the problem, what we think the problem is at the time, because uh, we all have it with networks. You type some config in, you just get a weird error message back, and you've got no choice but to raise a tech case. If you're writing the code, this is your chance to do something about it. Um, so again, and think about those 3 a.m. on-call people. What are they, you know, they've got blurry eyes and they can barely see the screen, so I strongly recommend to write some human-friendly error messages. Same goes for logging. Just as you would log your networking, networking gear, you can log your software stack. There are lots of tools out there that will do things like API performance monitoring, so we can monitor the performance of our APIs and check when they're getting slow or they're starting to uh, return errors. Um, we can also catch errors if an API just simply fails. Um, we use Sentry, for example. Sentry aggregates all of the errors, gives them to humans, so humans know that something in the pipeline is broken. And fail safe. Um, again, so common tool that I mentioned earlier is Ansible. I think anyone here used Ansible ever? Yeah, pretty good number of people, I would say. So the default mode of Ansible, then, which most of you will know, is that when you run Ansible, um, its default mode is to apply all roles and tasks essentially to all devices. The default is just everything. So if you have some playbooks that push config to your network, if you run Ansible and don't specify, don't limit the hosts or the roles, it just will just push everything. That's a terrible, terrible default. Like by default, it will just push config to your entire network. Um, so I strongly suggest you go through your automation stack and think about what happens when you run things with missing arguments or no arguments or the wrong arguments, um, especially if you're taking data in from the public, like you know, we, are, we are accepting orders through an API in a portal, but also internally. Um, so that's it, I think. Um, any questions? So if I was using this, I would want to be able to compare the results of a two different potential orders, or more than two different potential orders, because the end user probably doesn't necessarily know that a specific source destination pair is the right answer for the connectivity that they're trying to buy. So support in the tool set for doing that would be something that I would think would be a valuable addition if you don't do it already. Maybe you do it already. Uh, we don't, but it's a good, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's a good idea. At the minute, we kind of have a sort of rudimentary sort of uh, documents on how to use the tool, um, public-facing documentation on how to use the, the, the portal, the wizard thing. Um, but it's a good point. Uh, I have literally just come back from holiday, so that's my get out of jail free card, right? Today's my first day back from holiday, so I haven't looked at the documentation in a while, so I'm not sure how uh, technically deep it is. 
Um, but I'll take it away. It's a good, it's a totally valid point. And I have another observation, which is that long ago I was part of a startup which used the actual network topology, which it built from the configuration, as the way as a way in which the users could interact with the network. So rather than using an API with pure text, it had the option, and this would now be way easier in terms of process load, to look at an actual network topology diagram and say, click here, click here, show me the possible paths, and then it had a performance element in it too. So something like that would be, again, something that might possibly be of interest or use to people who were running this, had this kind of problem. Yes, yeah, I mean, uh, if anyone is interested in that kind of thing, I would thoroughly recommend there's a Python module called Network X. It's very easy to get started. You can, yeah, you can, it's really easy just to load your topology up in it and then see all the paths. Um, I wrote a Python module uh, called Pi FRR Fast Free Root. It's, so it calculates all that kind of stuff. Best paths, alternative paths, TI LFA paths and stuff. Um, so I would recommend it to anybody who, who wants to do that. Hi, James. It took me a moment to work out what CI was. Ah, um, sorry. Would you like to tell people what is it continuous integration? And if so, why is it nifty? Yes, sure. Sorry, sorry. Um, so yeah, I mentioned about CI in there. What I was talking about was continuous integration. Continuous integration is a concept where um, so we have our code base sitting in, in uh, GitLab. You can raise a merge request if you want to change something. And continuous integration, what that means is we have a set of automated steps that run. When you raise a merge request, uh, these steps run. They will test the code, test, test that it's valid, that it runs, that the outcome is what it should be. There's like a bunch of steps that it goes through to check that the end result is what we would like it to be. Um, and the useful thing about continuous integration is that it allows um, anyone to kind of make a pull request to one of our repositories who is not that familiar with the code and it doesn't have to be um, very deeply reviewed by something. I don't have to wait for someone who's really familiar with the code to come and um, review it. The, the CI tests mean that anyone who's not so familiar with that code can see, oh yeah, the CI tests are passing and I can actually have a quick look through the code to make sure that kind of it's sane and nothing crazy without having to really understand the code in depth. So it lets us kind of test stuff and deploy stuff kind of more confidently and quicker. Uh, and I would thoroughly recommend it. Cathy. I have a remote question from Pierre-Yves mm. from F5, who asks, how do you deal with customers pushing config all the time? Do you have any concurrent access issues, or do you do them in batch? As how does that work with your own operations? OK, that's like two questions in one. Uh, how do we deal with customers um, pushing config all the time yeah. in concurrency? So the first issue was concurrency. Um, OK, so we, we do not have an issue with this. There's, there's two things that play in our favor. You can, you can decide if they're good or bad for yourself. The first thing is um, we sell IP transit. That's not the kind of thing you get 100 orders a minute for. Um, I think even the biggest IP transit providers in the world aren't getting you know, 100 orders a day. right? So. It's kind of the type of product that we're selling it just doesn't lead to like enormous crazy order volumes so we don't have issues with things like you know, so that this everything we've written is in python for example which is not everyone knows is not very fast but it's not a problem because we don't get a thousand orders a day um so that's that's one thing uh but the second thing is we do actually implement locking uh, there's a reason for that um i mentioned earlier so uh, i had that slide up with our architecture um, this, so I mentioned that the, the, along the bottom of the squares is DCM IPAM, that is Netbox, which I've grown to hate. Um, but some of the other boxes, they're a mixture of kind of off the shelf stuff and stuff that we've developed in house. Um, and so Net, Netbox, for example, Cortex implements locking because Netbox can't. Don't forget that Netbox has a web GUI and stuff like that, and anyone could just log in and make a change at any point. So we make sure that everything goes through Cortex. If two th people are making an API call to Cortex at the same time, both happen to be uh, related to Netbox, it will lock Netbox and make them uh, one at a time and not in parallel. Um, so there's a few other places in the pipeline where we kind of lock the stuff, um, make a change, and then unlock it. It's also the same with device deployment. So um, config is in Netbox. 
a box next to it. It says config versioning and validation. So what we actually do is um, we export all of the data from NetBox. We actually read it directly from the Postgres database because the API is too slow. We read from the Postgres database directly. We dump that into structured data, so like YAML, which lives in Git because NetBox doesn't have any versioning. Hooray! So we actually export everything to Git all the time. Then we have versioning so we can see what has happened. That then gets rendered out and pushed to the devices. So that's also another place we implement locking so that you can't be doing multiple device exports at the same time. I think we're getting the signal to, to chop it off there. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thanks very much.